Amy Poehler lives in my building. And I was kind of, I felt slightly embarrassed because I've been seeing her for weeks and I'd never said anything to her. And then I just had to lean over and just say, I've got to tell you, I'm a massive fan of The Mighty Bee, which is this cartoon <laughs> that, like, it was the, like, which, which one person here knows. No, I know and The Mighty like, Bee. It's and great. I love it. But I always, I'm, I'm always scared to, like, admit that that's perhaps not the one thing she would have liked me to pick out of her right, right, right. catalog of work. Yeah. The Mighty Bee is a show that I wanted to cover for nearly eight years, probably since before the start of my channel. I'd never be able to get past the first few episodes. But you know what? I'm doing it now. It's turning 15 this year, it hasn't been written off by Paramount Plus for taxes yet, and it just feels right to review three dog cartoons in a row. Look, I may be a dirty Sparky Defender, but I know for a fact that Happy got snubbed from the Nick Jr. Paw Patrol Instagram theater ad. I don't want to start off too negative, though. I'm aiming to match the energy of the Associated Press review. Unbridled spirit, wild imagination, that's Bessie. I think there's a few reasons why this cartoon has been something I wanted to dig into since forever. To start, it was basically my first Nicktoon. Yes, that honor technically goes to SpongeBob, but I remember seeing its premiere be heavily promoted, only watched half of the first season, and didn't think about it again until years later. Now that's a Nicktoon. Wait, no, here's the I didn't get the chance to see the show evolve or get an idea of what it was trying to say. I mostly just remember how it made me very uncomfortable. And that was before I watched the episode inspired by Silent Hill. At long last, we'll dive into the Mighty Bee's history and what I watched back in the day, how I saw it then, how I see it now, and the impact it's made on me. As always, I'll try to make the most definitive review of the series out there. Well, second most definitive. Now let's prepare for the fun with some vocal warm-ups. Oh! Whoa! This was the brainchild of three creators, Amy Poehler, Cynthia True, and Eric Weiss. Nickelodeon was looking for comedies with female leads, while True was a writer on Fairly Odd Parents, and Weiss was a writer and board artist on SpongeBob. Inspiration came from a photo of the former at six years old, crammed into a brownie dress, as well as the intense Girl Scout character that Poehler would perform at the Upright Citizens Brigade's improv shows. She channeled the same energy used to portray other hyperactive tweens like Caitlin on SNL and Andy Richter's sister Stacy on Conan. <laughs> True and Weiss called up Polar, eager to shape her character into someone more aspirational. They strive to stay away from stale stereotypes, wanting protagonist Bessie Higginbottom to feel like a real person living in a real city, separating her from SpongeBob. Well, he could be real. There's only one way to find out. Water, check. Taffy, check. Headlamp, check. Medical records, check. One copy of Atlas Shrugged? Check. Bessie, no! The Honey Bee Scout works to obtain all the available merit badges in hopes that she'll become the superhero, the Mighty Bee, who adds a slight action element into the mix, but there's usually a clear separation between her fantasies and reality. <laughs> Bessie can understand her rambunctious and crafty pet Happy, and a rat can be disguised as a dog. But the show still has one foot grounded in reality. It helps that there's usually an emotional underpinning supporting a relatable premise. Little orphan Happy questions his relationship with Bessie when the mutt's mother comes back into his life. Does he see himself as a part of the Higginbottom family? Is Bessie like a parent to him? Is their bond stronger than a blood relative? This extra layer tends to bring new traits out of the characters and helps these somewhat basic stories leave an impact, much like this joke it on me. Happy told us everything. <gasps> You're not Happy's mom. There's an imposter among us. I had to fight myself not to do this. Like Amy Poehler, much of the voice cast also came from improv or sketch comedy. Every 6 to 11 year old's favorite. Andy Richter from Conan brings the joke full circle by voicing Bessie's younger brother, Ben, who yearns to be her superhero sidekick. But I'm already cool, mom said. Dana Furman from UCB plays the sweet and shy but easily misguided Penny, Bessie's second in command within the Honeybees. There's an invitation to my birthday party, Bessie. It's a big one. I'm halfway to a hundred. Keenan Thompson from SNL and Baby SNL is Bessie's radical rock and skater pal Rocky. We'll see you then. When's then? Later then. There's also Bessie's free-spirited mother, Hillary, the kind Chinese restaurant owner, Mr. Wu, a friendly hippie named Hippie, and imaginary friend, Finger. Look at that peak character design. Oh, 
Oh, how nonconformist, Finger. You look so emo. Everyone looks like a less angular My Life as a Teenage Robot character. Likely in part to staff members moving on to serve as art director and character designer, specifically Siona Hong and Alex Kerwan. Same deal with the initial color stylist, Ron Russell. I especially love how moody or abstract the palettes can get, especially in scenes set at dawn or dusk. This is also one of the few cartoons I've seen do the cinematic aspect ratio transitions I love editing into my videos whenever Bessie daydreams about being the Mighty Bee. So it gets props for that too. Just like Samurai Jack, these haven't aged the best now that HD is the standard for displays, creating a lot of negative space, but that's just a nitpick. Let me know if it bugs anyone else. The only area that's lacking are the title cards. Rarely do you get a unique design. Most use the same font and cycle through the same four backgrounds. Many have a note nailed on a door, setting up all the Martin Luther fans out there up for disappointment. The one with model sheet looking ass Bessie is obviously my favorite. Now in terms of animation, this didn't move like anything else on the channel at the time. Early on, there's a ton of superposed out character acting and run cycles, seemingly done in house. They're a great burst of energy, and the few cuts that have surfaced online are attributed to either Wayne Carlisi, a feature animator for Disney and Nickelodeon, or Eric Weiss himself. A volcano! Oh, that's Science 101! Amateur night! I'm gonna take a plaster a Paris stupid thing and fill it with baking soda? That's not gonna win me the mad scientist badge. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you got moments where the characters just go from pose to pose with no in-betweens. Guess you're not gonna get the badge this time. <laughs> This is usually only done intentionally for comedy, and otherwise only noticeable if you're paying close attention. I did see a small lack of lip sync and shots that are slightly hard to read, like I had to go frame by frame to see how Ben opens this door. But these were just early series growing pains. The animation generally bounces between those two extremes, but I wouldn't blame you for thinking that it looks inconsistent. Personally, I'd say that the drawings are usually funny enough to overlook any minor issues. Next. That's pretty much everything I remembered about the Mighty Bee before returning to it for this video. I have a ton of childhood memories linked to watching new episode premieres, taking the bus to summer camp, soccer practices, and eating Indiana Jones M&Ms. I'm glad I checked to make sure there was a creepy Harrison Ford M&M's ad to include here. Would have disappointed myself if I didn't. Some things just stay with you, like one of the best cartoon episode titles ever. Dang, it feels good to be a gamester, where the honeybees spend too much time gaming, and Bessie gets a number one victory royale in Fortnite. <laughs> The pilot for what was then titled Super Scout was greenlit on March 26, 2006 at 2.26 p.m. Thank you, birth certificate gag. It included some early designs and Rocky was originally voiced by Kevin Hart. Oh, what could have been. In the aired version, titled So Happy Together, Bessie trains and adopts Happy off the streets, forcing him to compete in the Honey Bee Dog Show, as the winners awarded the Animal Appreciation Badge. Only 4,583 badges to go! Awesome! Oh, we're so close! You got a clear story engine with Bessie's need to earn a new badge every episode, there's an upbeat score by Powerpuff and Foster's composer James Venable, Bessie knows a wide range of side characters to play around with, and Happy and Bessie's friendship forms a strong emotional core. It's a solid pilot that lays out everywhere this series can go. And what did the staff create using this foundation? Much of the show's identity was also shaped by storyboard artists, background painters, and co-directors that came from another iconic Nick tune, The Run and Stimpy Show. There's a reoccurring incidental with Stimpy's face and a title card reminiscent of an old promotional piece, both drawn by Bill Ray, whose fingerprints are all over the Mighty Bee. There's plenty of extreme close-up painted stills and general gross-out humor involving snot, body distortion, barf, and veins. All right, where were you? Penny, why are you barefoot? They didn't need to show that. What I recall freaking me out was whenever food was involved. This macaroni brain being ripped out of a robot, all these weird zucchini based products, and different sides touching each other on a plate. With the first two, I feel like Chow Me was imagining what it would be like to actually eat these foods, which no character does besides Happy. But an irrational fear of combining foods is the main topic of Ben Appetit. The story is literally about Bessie learning that she traumatized a very young Ben into making this a sensitive issue for him. Eat it, 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 eat it
did I not realize that this is all about me? Can you believe this is the sister episode to Dang It Feels Good to Be a Gamester? What a power couple. I don't think this episode about trauma gave me trauma. Like I never had the same problem Ben did before or after watching, but outside of the odd SpongeBob, I don't remember watching a cartoon like that. One that wanted to do something besides make me laugh, especially one with human characters. There's such an eerie vibe to the scene where Bessie hypnotizes Ben and literally enters his mind to break into his memories. Come on, unlock the door, Ben. You are letting me into your mind. Don't worry, I'm taking off my shoes before I go into your mind. This was the only time I remembered the show venturing into the surreal and fantastical. But apparently it came one episode after dinosaurs and magic body swaps were confirmed to exist. <laughs> Adding to the otherworldly sensibility is the background music. There's a few original songs, mostly in a pair of episodes about a battle of the bands or a concert, but everything else comes from the Associated Production Music Library, just like Ren and Stimpy before it. That's the reason why you hear the Mermaid Man of Barnacle Boy theme in that Simpsons Pretzels episode. You got a ton of dramatic orchestral tunes, stuff that sounds pulled from a 50s commercial, and some striking electronic music from French composer Jean-Jacques Perry. His song, Boys and Girls, is used as the credits theme. And it's stuck in my head because the earliest Nick.com flash game for the Mighty Bee just played it on loop. Jacques Perry is known for popularizing the Moog synthesizer, and his stuff really clashes with the otherwise traditional soundtrack. Nick Carr was the initial music editor, and he's had the same role on SpongeBob since day one. So that's probably why JGP's work has popped up again more recently. It's peppy, it's offbeat, it's fitting of Bessie's character, and it's in the YouTube copyright system, so I can't play it here. If you wish there was a version of the video with more production music, well, keep watching. I opted instead to use some similar sounding selections from The Plastic Cow Goes Moog by Mike Melovin. I took one look at the cover and I was sold. Definitely check out the YouTube playlist by one Luke Skywalker 202, who's done a terrific job cataloging each track from the series and where they played, continuing to update it with new uploads to this day. I'm pretty neutral on the theme by frequent Amy Poehler music collaborators, Amy Miles and Mike Robertson. The song is annoying, but it fits the cartoon's chaotic and playful energy. I don't know why there's about eight seconds of recycled clips used during the reprise. Feels like that section was thrown in to pad out the runtime, strung together by these weird crossfades they use sometimes. That being said, I barely ever skipped the intro because I loved looking at the original content. From time to time, I paused to identify extremely minor incidentals in this stack of 28 characters. I wish they updated it for season two, like other shows might. Come on, everybody, Associated production music is also used on the We Got the Bee DVD, one of two bare bones grab bag episode releases. I remember seeing it advertised often, so I checked it out from my local library for this project. Despite the name of this section, I think this weird mouse might be the scariest thing involving the show. Right up there with the actor who voices the factory manager character. Here's my iCarly transition music impression. Of all the plot devices introduced in So Happy Together, I think the one that powers the majority of season one is Bessie being antagonized by Honey Bee Queen Bees, Gwen Wu, and Portia Gibbons. Gwen comes from a large family, while Portia comes from a powerful one, with a bossy teenage cousin and an overbearing mom that always puts her first, especially since Ms. Gibbons is also the troop leader. Mommy, Bessie's in my room. Call the police. Try to ignore her, dear. She's helping Mommy sell her makeup. Do you want to stuff envelopes so Mommy can keep her van? Exactly. Now why don't you go read a magazine? Both get a sympathetic storyline and have their moments of support towards Bessie, but they're typically two heads of the same beast. They trick her into babysitting for them, they torture her with zucchini, and they expose her middle name, causing this to happen. This is how the episode ends. To be fair, Bessie can be just as invasive, trying to catch Gwen's chicken pox or discover Portia's secret, but it's very rare that either of these girls isn't the antagonist. You just kinda wanna see them give Bessie a break. Just look at it. They're not looking at it right. 
over the course of the season, I started seeing Bessie as a mini adult. Too analytical to turn her brain off just to do something as simple as understand a magic eye puzzle. She's an overachiever and entrepreneur, but also a natural control freak. So when told no, Bessie will find a way to get what she wants anyway. Nobody believes that the new honeybee taffy tastes wrong? Break into the factory to figure out what's going on. Get banned from the troop for farting during a meeting in a weird courtroom scene that feels like a fantasy but isn't? Find a badge supporting the natural flatulence of honeybees. <laughs> Believe that your pet might be living a secret double life? Stalk him. Must stay awake. This is one of my favorites from the season. It's the first time Happy lets Bessie into his secret dog world, bringing them closer together. Anytime they draw goofy animals, it makes an episode better. Love that nightclub dance scene too. I was right, this is a good thing to cover after Be Cool Scooby-Doo. Sometimes Bessie's exaggerated perspective comes from her being a child. Like a trip to the doctor's office becomes a nightmare at the sight of a needle. Bessie. But generally, it's notable that there's so many episodes where the entire world is against a woman who strives to bring positive change. It's almost like this female-driven show with a mostly female cast has a theme about feminism. At least, that's what I thought before Bessie did this. When I was keeping up with the Mighty Bee, I only think I saw the first 10 episodes, or at least parts of them. I remember just seeing an ending where Ben is trapped in a cage and never got context for that until 15 years later. Filling in the gaps, I think season one is fine. Apparently, the crew didn't have much development time and were figuring out both the visuals and tone as they went along. It's at its best when it puts character growth or relationships over pure gags, but by the time it wraps up, it still hasn't figured out its identity. Side characters like Rocky and Mr. Wu start to disappear here, the badge story engine is kind of phased out, the Mighty Bee fantasies are rare, and the season finale feels like a completely different show. Bessie, uh, do you know what time we're going to be done fighting for our future? Okay, to be fair, the Dragonfly's half hour special where the bees face off against a rival troop in a scavenger hunt for their rec center is another highlight. This conflict is treated with so much importance that there's Samurai Jack energy injected into the montages and atmosphere, parodying the Warriors. It's balanced out with a radical race to Alcatraz, backed by what sounds like a rejection Tony Hawk track. After watching this, it makes sense why you would get Eric Weiss to show run a Sonic cartoon. <laughs> I was almost considering ending the video here. You know, I came to terms with what spooked Baby Nick, and I came out with my own interpretation of what the series was about. But if I want to know the full effect it'll have on me, I might as well watch the rest and see how it changes what I think about- <laughs> Season 2 takes everything that worked before and makes it better. The only downgrade is that one of the two half-hour specials, where Bessie is knocked unconscious into thinking that she's a cat on Halloween, doesn't really go anywhere too interesting. Meow. It feels appropriately spooky and looks gorgeous, but stands out in a season that's great about escalating simple comedic premises. I just think they could have done more with a plot about Bessie role-playing in her fursuit. It's hard to compete with the other 22, Gorillas in the Midst, where Bessie trades places with Ben so that she can get into a masculine, boys only troop. Then in the back half, she misses the honeybees after joining. Also, Bessie uses a Mortal Kombat fatality on a lion. Additionally, plenty of entries are good, not great, but they stand out more because the bar has been raised so high. Bessie and Happy's friendship is now the driving force behind the show. Stories can still come from the troop and involve badges, almost nothing is completely left behind, but now the heart is firmly rooted in all the hijinks that are ensuing around the two Higginbottoms. And boy do they ensue. Your positive energy gives me gas. By simultaneously getting weirder and more character driven, I think the cartoon was able to shake the comparisons I was making to Spongebob or Ren and Stimpy and come into its own. Anything is possible now. Space travel, time travel, unicorns, and gangster fish are all real. If season one has Bessie go against the world, season two has Bessie inform it. 
She still has bouts of paranoia, but it's usually just Bessie getting in her own way, taking something too seriously, like not catching a glimpse of a cute puppy livestream. SP said that this was okay, but just Bessie's hair catching on fire was not. Gwen and Portia are used more uniquely and sparingly, but in Bess E, they trick her into thinking she's a robot. Standard season one premise. Here's the season two twist. Anyway, Shell Canada was super boring, but I got my maple syrup badge out of the way. Oh good, my robot's working. Maybe it's the episode where Bessie commits war crimes talking, but I get the sense that season two was written around the time Obama entered office. It's just more sunny and confident, and that extends to the visuals. Brighter colors, controlled gross out, stunning title cards, more consistent animation, and slight redesigns that allow for hyper expressive posing. I always saw The Mighty Bee as the last breath of the neo UPA inspired shows, so I'm happy to see it go out with a bang instead of just getting more on model like others do as they visually evolve. Sometimes Bessie is just a tiny off model gremlin, and that's great. <laughs> Trauma is still an in-universe theme. Irritating bowling syndrome is like season two's take on Ben Appetit. To bowl a 7-10 split, Bessie must confront her deep-seated, front teeth-related anxieties. Don't break up the complete set! Instead of forcing Ben to overcome his fear, Bessie actively takes control of her own subconscious to identify clues that help her uncover a repressed memory. Cramming in a barrage of psychedelic imagery and jokes targeting every nook and cranny of a bowling alley. Structurally, visually, and comedically, it's an improvement. So satisfying to see it all come together. Ah, I'm a shoe. Happy's past comes back to haunt him in the bone identity. Apparently, he was a secret agent for a shadow organization who faked his own death before meeting Bessie. Such a big swing, yet it's another personal favorite for using tons of clever and comedic callbacks to reinforce why Happy is who he is, and why he and Bessie are best friends forever and ever and ever. <gasps> Okay, okay, I've seen Happy do this. I can do it too. It ends on an unresolved cliffhanger, and the same can be said for Oh Brother What Art Thou and Stuffed Happens. A combined 44 minute special and the series finale on Paramount Plus. Ben already had a bigger role this season, but he finally confronts the idea of Happy replacing him as sidekick and becomes Bessie's nemesis, who gets Bessie suspended from the honeybees. No! It has its own action-packed identity, and they keep things fresh, even building to a nice emotional resolution between the siblings. But with the Mighty Bee themselves barely being in season two, it's harder to care about that side of Bessie. The episode produced as the finale, Come On Get Happy, is just a very cute 11 about Bessie and Happy trying to plan a two-year anniversary party, once again interrupted by Happy's spy past, and what seems like a pretty obvious nod to Tough Puppy, also in production at the time. Not a conclusive conclusion, but you get the sense that the crew knew that this was their last Oh, Haps! I don't know if you can see from your side, but I just sky wrote Bessie and Happy BFF AEAE and it looks really great. Have no fear, honeybees, for I am your glue. It's a metaphor, everybody! Co-director of The Mighty Bee's second season, Bill Ray, explained why the choice was made to pull the show from the network and burn it off onto Nicktoons six episodes into the second run. The channel's animation lineup around this time was dominated by boy-centric franchises, action, and CGI programs. Any 2D projects have been generating massive numbers for years, or came from established creators. I realize that I'm also describing their current output, but if they bounce back before, hopefully they can again. What's disappointing is that because The Mighty Bee was shafted onto a premium cable channel, so few people got to see it churn out some of the strangest, yet some of my favorite comedy I've seen in a modern cartoon, despite so much trial and error. Come on guys, let's lower the donuts. We're all cops here. You really think so, kid? Al Capone? Ah, I should have guessed. I would have loved to see the series get a third pickup, although making the jump to HD would take away some of that classic feel. So much of what it was trying to do was and still is rare for animation. Despite the female protagonist, I never questioned why I liked it as a kid because it made me laugh. I completely understand why Amy Poehler got a creator credit providing a great personality and performance that was elevated by the writers and artists. The jury's still out on if I can say the same thing about Duncanville. Mr. Mitch, 
I gave this Nicktoon another go because of my nostalgia for its beginnings, but what I came for was broken down and reconstructed over the course of 40 episodes. It was a journey that I found to be extremely rewarding, finding new meaning in themes and dynamics that were there from the start but took time to be fully realized. Also, I think I see a little too much myself in Bessie. Yay! Paperwork! At the end of the day, I'm glad I got to see it through and learn that the Mighty Bee was inside us all along. Which is actually the case for Bessie, uh, cause she sees herself as a mighty bee, but it's also, also it was never such a thing in the show itself. Honey.